Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, we're glad everyone is here this morning, and uh, the weather has cooperated uh, more or less because we didn't have more snow, and uh, we're able to get out. Um, we're, we don't have to dream about a white Christmas here in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, it's, it's our usual reality, but uh, thank you so much for being here this morning as we wrap up our study of the book of Revelation. And, um, oh, there we go, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, thank you, Bert. And uh, we're, we're just grateful for all of you being here. And, of course, Sandra isn't here. She's got double duty today because uh, she gets these notes ready every week, week in and week out. But she's in the part of the singing group this morning in the morning service. So uh, uh, we're missing Sandra, but uh, I hope she hears this before she uh, puts it online. But she's also done a very super job of putting all of this available uh, the, the last two and a half years, in fact, uh, all the way through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and uh, not only the, uh, uh, the sound in that class, but also the uh, 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 handouts are all on there. So uh, this is, uh, and uh, just grateful for that. So uh, Sandra, if you see this before you post it, thank you. <laughs> And thanks also to all of you. Uh, uh, we just are so blessed by the fellowship we have, not only here in class, but uh, throughout the week. And uh, uh, if I'm moving a little more slowly today, it's because last night we had just a delicious dinner with uh, Reuben and Berta. And uh, I, uh, I don't think I'll need to eat today or tomorrow. Uh, I, I enjoyed uh, that uh, so much. And but just thankful that all of us are able to be here and fellowship together. This is a wonderful season of the year as we celebrate and remember the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, how God in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus, invaded human history and provided salvation for us. And we're going to be looking at the closing of the book of Revelation. And the Christ we see as we close Revelation is not the child meek and mild who came in Bethlehem, but this is the one who's coming again, and as we'll see and as Revelation tells us, uh, it may be soon, and uh, I trust that every one of us here is ready for Christ to come again. It's one of those things where we are uh, looking forward to it, and yet not always anxious or eager in the sense of right today, and yet uh, today may be the day, and so as we gather together, let's ask God to open our minds and hearts to that which has been revealed about the God's plan for eternity and the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful for all of your goodness and grace to us. We are blessed beyond measure. Thank you, too, that we can look back on the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and recognize that his birth was for a purpose. He came in one sense to die but not to end in death, but to be raised again to provide salvation. And Father, we're grateful that through the death of Christ and his resurrection, we have forgiveness from sin and we have new life in him. And Father, we can look forward to eternity and to all that you have provided. Father, as we open the book of Revelation today, we'll be looking at uh, that new heaven and that new earth and that new Jerusalem. Father, we acknowledge that what you have planned is so far beyond our experience and our temporary and present uh, world that it's hard for us to grasp. But thank you, Father, that you have revealed that to us. And we give you thanks for it. And we look forward to that personal union with Christ in that new heaven. Father, again, open our minds, our hearts to the truth of your word as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've mentioned it already, but thank you again for all your kind words and uh, cards and gifts. We've been blessed beyond measure, and it's been a great joy for us to be able to uh, teach this. Uh, God has been gracious because uh, I, I uh, was blessed by gifted teachers, and uh, I wanted to uh, uh, teach myself. And so I, I spent about 10 years after high school preparing to teach. Two years out of seminary, I was asked to become a college president. 
And uh, I, I've got a sign that says, uh, yeah, uh, two years ago I didn't know how to spell president, and now I are one. You know? and, uh, uh, but for over 30 years I was in administration, not able to teach. So I, I'm just so grateful. It's like the Jesus miracle at Cana of Galilee when the host said, you've saved the best till last. I don't regret, uh, resent those 30-plus uh, years in administration. But I am so grateful that for the last 25 years, I've been able to indulge my passion and preference. And thank you for being part of that. Uh, and Mary and I have been blessed so much by your fellowship. Well, we come now to the uh, last two chapters of the book of Revelation. And uh, we're so grateful that God has uh, a plan for not just our present, but also for our eternal future. And in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, we're going to see uh, what I've titled Heaven, Home at Last. And if we need to have Stuart Hamblin here saying, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Uh, but uh, uh, you and I have a home in heaven that uh, John uh, wrestles with finding the, the language and the words to describe what is eternal, what is quite literally out of this world, but will be our eternal home. And so he's going to talk about the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. And he opens right away with that in chapter 21 and verses 1 and 2. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. One of the things, uh, I'm sorry if you happen to like uh, going on a vacation on a, uh, one of these cruise ships, there will be no cruise ships in the eternal state. Uh, there are no seas, but uh, that does not mean that uh, the world is going to be without beauty. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, it's, it's impossible for us to fully comprehend this, this new heaven and new earth that God has prepared and planned. And yet John is here trying to explain it to us. And uh, he is, if you recall, in the Old Testament, Israel was viewed as the wife of Jehovah. In the New Testament, the church is seen as the bride of Christ. What we'll see in these closing chapters of Revelation is that uh, uh, both Israel and uh, the church in the New Testament are all united in heaven and all enjoying uh, God's eternal provision. Salvation in the Old Testament and in the New has always been through the death of Christ on the cross. His death on the cross was the only sufficient sacrifice for sin. In the Old Testament, they looked forward to it. And you recall Hebrews could tell us that, uh, and Jesus could say, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Uh, Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He was looking forward to a savior. And you and I look back on the finished work of Christ, but salvation has always been by grace, through faith, in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Anticipating it and looking back on it. And uh, he talks here about a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. And this is not the first time we see it in Scripture. If you go all the way back to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah, uh, God says to Isaiah, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. I, I didn't realize the import of that so much as when I looked at this passage, I thought, well, uh, it's, somehow we, don't, we think of this present world. Now, in heaven and in eternity, you and I won't be sitting around, remember when? Uh, because we won't be looking back. Uh, we'll be in a new environment entirely. He said, the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But he says, but be glad and rejoice in what I will create, as God speaking. I will create Jerusalem to be a delight as people, a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. And something that will be missing from uh, the eternal state, from uh, this heavenly uh, city, is the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. We'll see this again. But uh, Paul picks up that same theme in uh, Corinthians when he says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Uh, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit, Paul says. That is, God has given us a glimpse of the future but the full understanding and comprehension of it is really beyond our, our ability to make comparisons with the present. And so when we come now to the book of Revelation, uh, 
the, the key thing to remember about heaven is that God is there and we will be with him forever. Uh, God is present everywhere. God is omniscient in that sense uh, and omnipresent. And yet there's going to be a sense of the very real presence of God in this eternal state. We're told, John said, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. God dwells within through the Holy Spirit, a concept you and I wrestle with because we, we don't see, we don't hear, we don't have a tangible experience of God's presence. But we will in the eternal state. He said that God himself will be with them and be their God. And something else that we look forward to in heaven is he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. I doubt that there's any one of us here today who has not had to say farewell to a family member, to a loved one, to a friend. So many times in our experience we've had to say goodbye. And it's painful uh, because we uh, lament the loss of them, and yet they're not going to be lamenting their death in heaven. They're going to be rejoicing in the presence of God, and you and I will be able to rejoice with them. I'll be honest, I, I, I can't explain, I don't know for sure, uh, what we will look like in heaven. Uh, I hope I'll have more hair there than I have now. Uh, yes. Yeah, and this, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, so it's going to be, a, a, and this is one of the questions we'll have when we look at it this morning, because uh, this new earth is going to be, uh, uh, John at one point is on a high mountaintop looking down. And uh, uh, so we, we see there's going to be topography, though there are no seas. So there's a lot we don't know about the new heaven and the new earth, but there is going to be a new earth. And uh, you and I will be uh, have access to the heavenly city, but we'll see in a moment that there are going to be gates and people coming and going. And so you and I will have the uh, uh, ability to move about, but there's so much we don't fully comprehend about uh, what we'll we be doing. But one thing we won't be doing is lamenting sin or remembering things that uh, take away from our joy in the presence of God. No more death, no more mourning or crime crying or pain and God says the one who is seated on the throne said I am making everything new and John is told to write this down for these words are trustworthy and true uh, to use the expression from today you can bank on this uh, in other words this is uh, absolutely true and reliable and so uh, John uh, in this vision of, of the eternal state uh, he hears God say, I, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last letters of the Greek uh, alphabet. I'm the beginning and the end. God always has existed, always will exist, but we're going to be see his presence uh, in a very real sense and a unique sense in this eternal state. He said, that, to the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And... Uh, you and I know that today we, we need water. Water is so essential for the sustenance of life. And yet this is going to be the water of life uh, in the eternal state. It's going to be, and we'll see in a few moments, there's going to be a river that's flowing. Uh, and uh, I, some questions I still have, if there are fruit trees with uh, uh, every month there's a new fresh fruit. And you say, well, if there's fresh fruit every month, will we be eating it? Uh, it would seem reasonable to think that we would, and yet uh, that's not described here. Well, something you won't find in he heaven, and that is the, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, uh, idolaters, all of these, uh, these are going to be suffering. This is one of the tragedies, is that people outside of Christ do not have all of the blessings of heaven to anticipate but rather a, a, an eternity of separation from God and some very real and conscious suffering. Uh, this is such an awesome and awful picture that uh, uh, we ought to do everything possible to warn people to say, listen, you don't want to go there. And God has provided salvation through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. No one needs to go there. 
but all without Christ will go there. But John goes on then to describe the, the new Jerusalem, uh, our, our forever home. And he it says, one of the seven angels, remember we've seen seven angels before with seven uh, bowls. One of them, we don't know which one, comes to John and says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. In the New Testament, you recognize the church is the bride of Christ. In the Old Testament, uh, the nation Israel is spoken of, of as the wife of Jehovah, the wife of the Lord. So there's this, this sense of union with God in both the Old and New Testament. We're told that John says, he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem. Now, one of the questions you have, well, John is on a high mountain. He's looking at the new Jerusalem. So there's a topography there that somehow in this new earth, there's also a place for the new Jerusalem, but there's more than just this one city there. But even though the city, as we'll see in a moment, is going to be incredibly large and expansive. Um, he goes on to describe that this uh, city is shown with the, the glory of God. The brilliance was like that of precious jewel. And he said, he sees around this new Jerusalem a wall that had 12 gates. And uh, he, he's told with 12 angels at the gates, on the great gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, Revelation describes that in this heavenly city, New Jerusalem, uh, uh, there, there will be four sides to it, as it were, and three gates on each side, each one bearing the name of one of the tribes of Israel. So obviously there's a Jewish element to the New Jerusalem. Uh, the, the Jewish believers, those who uh, looked to God in faith, will be there and are remembered there. But we're notice also there's a wall. Now the wall is not designed to keep people out. Uh, the wall is just designed to encompass and uh, contain a, and, and uh, highlight that city. We're told the wall of the city had 12 foundations. On them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you've got the New Testament apostles uh, who form, as it were, a foundation for this wall. So the picture you get is John is, is seeing this, and he's trying to uh, understand and explain in, in terminology that, that John could understand, that we could understand, a city with a wall and a city with walls with a foundation. So you, what you do see and carry away from this is that the uh, New Jerusalem is going to uh, gather together and be home to both the uh, believers of Israel in the Old Testament and the believers in Christ in the church in the New Testament. As I said before, salvation has always been by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. In the Old Testament, looking forward to it. In our case, looking back to it. But the salvation has always been by grace through faith and in the finished work of Christ on the cross. So that's the focal point. And that's why God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit will be the focal point in this new Jerusalem. We're told here that uh, the angel who talked with John had a measuring rod of gold. <laughs> uh, I've got a, a few tape measures at home, and I've got a few rulers. I don't have one that's made of gold. Uh, I've got one that's gold-colored, but uh, it, it's not worth uh, any more than a plastic would be. But the fact is here, he's, he measures uh, the uh, walls and the city, and he says it was laid out in a square as long as it was wide, when he measured the city, uh, and uh, John puts it into terminology that you and I couldn't understand, uh, he talks about being 12,000 stadia. Now, we don't use that terminology or measurement today, but it would be almost 1,500 miles. So if you look at it, uh, that's from the uh, uh, Canadian border all the way to Texas. So, uh, those of you who go to Brownsville in the wintertime, uh, you're, you're still within the confines of the New Jerusalem. Uh, it, it's a vast city in that sense, uh, and it's, it's almost pyramidical in shape. At least we're told it's as wide and high as it is long. What we don't know in the description is exactly, uh, is it like a pyramid or is it uh, uh, just some, somehow like high-rises? Uh, and those of us who are from the prairies say, listen, uh, uh, 
If I get that high, I'll get a nosebleed probably, you know. Well, you won't in the New Jerusalem. But whether it's a pyramidal in shape or a, a square, the fact is it's going to be a massive, massive city. But the point is uh, not everyone is living there in the new uh, in, in the heaven. There's access coming and going. There are gates to it. And there's a sense in which believers in Christ, whether Old Testament or New Testament, will, will have freedom, will be moving, will have access. So many things we don't know or understand fully about heaven, but with some things we do know that are very important and encouraging. And so you've got this wall and something else, uh, when you're saying, uh, uh, I'm going to walk the streets of gold. Well, quite literally in heaven you will. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. And uh, uh, the, 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 the foundation is going to be uh, incredible. Now, for us, we look at it and say, well, <laughs> where are they going to get all the gold? You know, even Fort Knox uh, doesn't have that much. But the reality is God as creator is not limited in his ability to provide the raw materials to build with the lavish beauty you see here in heaven. And he goes on to describe the foundation stones, as it were, and, uh, and you've got these uh, uh, 12 foundation stones, each of them a, uh, a gem of rare beauty. Uh, the, the whole con uh, construct of this new Jerusalem uh, is just uh, like a rainbow of color and incredible value. Uh, you and I look at it and say, well, is this just fantasy? No, we'll see before we end <laughs> the book of Revelation. You better not treat this as fantasy. Uh, this is reality. The problem is John is just uh, at a loss to be able to describe the beauty uh, and the extent and significance of heaven in terms that we here on earth readily understand. <clears throat> because to us, gems are, are incredibly valuable, but also tiny and small. I don't know, uh, men, when you bought your first engagement ring for your bride, uh, it, it probably didn't weigh her down. Uh, it, it was just a small, tiny little stone, but a great significance to it. But in heaven, these uh, 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 stones are going to be so large and beautiful that they can form a foundation for the wall. And then the 12 gates, he said, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. And the, again, you, you can get a pearl of, uh, you know, of relatively significant size uh, and uh, Yet a pearl that's large enough for a gate that the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. Uh, and, and you and I have just never seen a pearl of that size. It does not mean God can't do it. What it does mean is we're living in a world where God is going to be create in such incredible beauty and uh, such lavish uh, uh, wealth that you and I today cannot even comprehend uh, the extent of it. But with God, this is not a challenge. If God can create a universe so vast that even we've been able to put men in space, we have not begun to reach the outer limits of uh, space. And if God can create a universe so vast and so capable of, uh, uh, of sustaining itself and staying uh, stable, God certainly is able to create a city as magnificent and beautiful as New Jerusalem will be. And uh, you and I can look forward to it. We'll be able to gain access to it to come and go. It does not appear that everyone will be living in New Jerusalem necessarily all the time because we're going to see coming and going. We're going to see activity and worship. And uh, what he does say is that... Uh, uh, when we get to heaven, you and I won't be saying, oh, isn't this beautiful? Uh, we used to joke about it, you know, in Texas. Uh, in Texas, everything is bigger and better. And uh, uh, they, they tell about this fellow that, that died, and he uh, got to it and said, oh, man, this is beautiful. I never knew that heaven was like Texas. And someone said to him, buddy, this is not heaven. No. Uh, well, the fact is, uh, 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 heaven is going to be beyond description and in that sense. He said, John says, uh, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. In other words, we don't go to a place of worship. The person we worship will be, in a real sense,
present, and you and I will enjoy the presence of God in ways that now are, are real, I would hope, but intangible. But there will not only be real, but it will be tangible. And he said, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. Well, you know, here in North Dakota in December, uh, we don't see a lot of the sun. And when it does show up, quite frankly, it's on uh, uh, just borrowed time. It, it doesn't warm things up greatly. Uh, but the fact is there, the, the glory of God will provide the light for New Jerusalem. Uh, there's going to be some sense in which there's no darkness, there, there's no evil, uh, there's no, uh, no obscuring of the reality of heaven. And uh, the Lamb is its lamp. So you've got the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit present and uh, very real uh, in a tangible sense in this new Jerusalem. And he goes on to add, uh, the nations will walk by its light. So it, heaven's going to be an international city. Now, I don't think you have to have a passport. You, you won't have to uh, uh, have proof of citizenship and so on, except for being a citizen of heaven. Uh, but the reality is the nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. And I don't know the, the full import of that. But obviously there's a sense in which it, in the eternal city, this, this new Jerusalem, uh, the, the wealth is going to be incredible. There's nothing we can bring to it that would add to uh, these pearls and this gold and these uh, valuable gems. So in other words, no, no wealth than, that any king has, uh, even if we took the gold in Fort Knox, <laughs> God says, well, I might be able to, uh, uh, that, that's just about enough to, to play to watch. You know, uh, God is going to provide such incredible wealth, and yet there's going to be a sense in which people come to worship, and whatever they bring is, is uh, in that sense, an expression of their worship. But on no day will the gates ever be shut. I won't ask how many of us have uh, uh, security on our uh, homes. <laughs> we don't want that broadcast anyway. But uh, I'm sure all of us have uh, locks on our doors and on our windows. And I, as I, I've said before, I spent four and a half years as a security guard, and to this day, I have to be sure I go around to every door at night and check it. I said, well, listen, uh, no one's going to break. And you, you've got them locked all day. I know, but that's my job. You know, to go around and, and check and make sure all of those doors are locked and all of the lights are off, except the night light, you know. And it's not that I'm afraid of the dark, but when I get up at night, I do need a night light. So uh, you and I live in a world, in other words, of limitation like that. He says, there be no night there, but the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Now, with all of the magnificent glory we've seen in heaven, uh, I have to ask, uh, and I have to wonder myself, what could nations add to it? What could nations bring into it? But it's obviously the sense that everything that, that people have and that nations have will be there and will be given to God. There, there's nothing that, uh, that God needs that we can supply except simply acceptance and worship. But uh, there's going to be that sense of giving. But we, what won't be there is anything impure. And now heaven's going to be a perfect place. Only the redeemed will live there. And uh, we recognize that if you and I went to heaven now, it wouldn't be a perfect place. I shouldn't say you and I. If I went there, uh, you know, because you may be a perfect person already, but I have a lot of ground yet to cover. And I don't think I'll get it covered until the translation, until the eternal state. But the reality here is that uh, uh, nothing impure will ever enter it. And nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. Uh, nothing that's going to take place in heaven will have to be apologized for or explained, uh, except if it's so unusual and so new and so splendid that we might need comprehending of it. But he said, uh, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And uh, every time someone comes to faith in Christ, their name is written in that book. And it's written with indelible ink. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, no, no one's going to blot it out. No one's going to erase it. Uh, simply by faith in Christ, you and I have access into the presence of God here and now. 
and eternally we can anticipate and look forward to being in the presence of Christ. Now, all of us, I expect, have loved ones, friends, and, and so on, uh, that have gone before us and are now in the presence of God. Uh, somehow, I think we will recognize them, but we won't be going around, remember when, you know, and uh, looking back, uh, we'll be simply living in a new state where everything is so new that it's the provision God has made for us and for all of us in Christ that we'll be looking at what is, not what was or used to be. And uh, heaven is going, again, if there's any doubt, uh, heaven is only for the redeemed. Uh, John makes that clear here, and God makes that clear to John. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, and uh, clear as crystal. And I, I, I can't explain fully how this works and why it is so strategically important because I don't know that we'll be eating or drinking a lot, and yet there's this river of the water of life that flows down, and he's described on each side of the river stood the tree of life. Uh, and a bit of a, a question here, is, is the tree of life something somehow that's planted on both sides and it hangs over uh, the river like that, or is it a series of trees uh, of life on the side? Whatever the case, it's obvious that uh, uh, there's life-giving quality, and it bears 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Um, I tried planting some apple trees in southern Manitoba one time, and uh, it wasn't a particularly successful experiment. Uh, but the only thing you can raise is crab apples, maybe. And uh, frankly, they're not my favorite fruit. Uh, but the, the fact is, here are going to be these, and but he describes it, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I mark that with an asterisk because uh, uh, we say, well, if there's healing of the nations, does that mean there's disease and everything else we need healing? Uh, it, probably, and I, I can't complain, I can't uh, uh, criticize the translators, but I do think it, it would be helpful if they uh, used a different word because the word literally in the Greek is therapeutic. And uh, uh, if we look at it from that standpoint, therapeutic is not necessarily healing from something of the past. It's life-giving, it's life-sustaining, it's well-being. And so what is here, the leaves of the tree are for the well-being uh, of the nations. In other words, it's not something to cure uh, a, a past problem. It's something simply to sustain and add to life in that sense. And no longer will there be any curse. Uh, you know, <laughs> if you've been a farmer, you know that you don't have to plant thorns and thistles. You don't have to plant Russian thistle. Uh, it comes of its own. And, uh, but we're going to find in heaven there's no curse. There's nothing like that infecting it. And there's also no uh, more night or darkness. We'll tell there be no more light. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. As I said, when, when we travel, I admit I do pack a little night light. Because when I'm in a strange place in a hotel or something, I, I may want to know where is everything at night. And so I'll pack this nice little night light. You won't need a night light in heaven. And, and, and you won't need to worry about security systems there. Uh, there won't be any night watchman. Uh, I, I don't know what I'll do in heaven, but I'm sure I'll be able to find some other job to do. But the fact is the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Uh, you and I are not going to be subjects, but we'll be uh, able in some sense to participate in what God is doing. And uh, there's, there's a promise you can count on. I said before, one of the statements he's made here, you can bank on it. Well, you can hear. He repeats this. These words are trustworthy and true. Uh, what John is describing is so outside of the realm of normal, everyday experience that uh, you and I and others might read it and say, well, that just sounds preposterous. That sounds beyond reality. No, this is not science fiction, John is told. It's trustworthy and true. And the Lord, who God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things which must soon take place. John is writing around 94, 95, 
maybe as late as 96 AD. So that's almost 2,000 years ago, but the sense of which in, in the lay of eternity, uh, that is a, uh, that's just a, a, a sundown or a sunset. It's no length of time at all. And then Christ says again, I, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy written in this scroll. And uh, blessing is pronounced when you and I read the book of Revelation. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to understand. One thing we ought to carry away with us is that we have been blessed through reading and studying it. In other words, it has given us a, a sense of assurance about God's plan for the future and a greater confidence in where we are now and what God is doing. And John goes on to say, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. I fell down at the feet of the angel to worship. And twice John has to be reminded. He is so caught up. And I don't think you and I should be critical of John because if we were there, we would have been doing the same thing. The one who has revealed this truth, the truth itself is so gripping and so spectacular it's just natural we, we want to worship the one who brings that vision. And John is told, don't do that. Uh, the angel says, worship God. That you and I do not worship angels. Uh, we, uh, we worship God alone. Angels are God's servants and ministers, uh, just as you and I are, just as John was. But uh, the end is not that far away and we're told uh, then uh, the angel said don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll now normally uh, when they wrote it they didn't have books like we have and sheets uh, they, they had a scroll that would be made of multiple sheets of uh, uh, papyrus or in some cases they used actually lamb skin but it would be uh, arranged in a roll like that, and they could write on it, and they would write a section, and then they could roll it, and often they would seal that at that point. And so uh, John has been uh, uh, opening a scroll where you could see the seals and break the seals, but here he's told, don't seal up the words of this scroll because the time is near. In other words, John, uh, this is going to happen relatively soon uh, in human uh, terminology, so don't seal up the rest of this. Uh, and, and you and I look and I say, well, 2,000 years, that's, that's a long time. But uh, when you look at eternity, it's just a, 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 a handbreadth is all. It's just a, a pause, as it were. And we're told, and again, he says, let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Listen, if you're from Missouri, uh, okay, uh, you know, we used to always say, he, from Missouri, you can't tell him anything. I think that's picking on Missouri a little bit. Uh, he probably was from uh, Manitoba. Uh, well, well, no, I'll pick on Manitoba. Uh, Saskatchewan, maybe, where I was born. I would pick on Saskatchewan. Uh, the, but the reality is, uh, here he says, the time is near, and let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Uh, He's not saying, don't preach the gospel, don't try to reach people. But he's saying, listen, people have a choice to make. And if they refuse to make the choice, uh, they're going to have to accept the consequences. And all of us, by, by God's grace and goodness, have been exposed to the gospel of Christ. Uh, Mary and I have been listening. We've got CDs, and we put them in the car, and we're listening to Bev Shea sing. Uh, we still remember uh, back when the uh, Manitoba and the Winnipeg built their new Centennial Hall. Uh, one of the friends of uh, uh, Bev Shea, uh, they, they could sponsor a seat. So they, they sponsored a seat in his name. And he came and actually gave a concert there to 700 and some uh, people. Uh, so Bev Shea was, was there and singing. And uh, uh, you and I are going to be enjoying worship and uh, We'll be uh, uh, able to sing then. I, I won't be able to sing. I said before, I'm, I, uh, the only singer in my family, family was a sewing machine. And, uh, uh, but uh, but I, I need to qualify that because uh, Ma Mary and her sister used to sing in church, and Mary has a good voice. Uh, but, well, uh, we won't dwell anymore on that. It's just one of the... 
one of the hazards and handicaps of life. Uh, but the, the reality is, they said, let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Uh, uh, th the point is, everyone has a choice to make. And I'm so grateful that uh, uh, at the age of 18, uh, someone gave me a Bible. And a friend invited me to a Sunday school class where I heard the good news that Christ came and died for me. And uh, the decision shortly after graduating from high school to open my heart and life to Christ. And uh, a life transformed me, but an eternity transformed me experience. So when you came to faith in Christ, it wasn't just a change of life. It was the change of your eternal destiny. And you and I immediately by faith have a home in heaven uh, provided for by God, available to each and every one of us through faith in Christ. Not through anything we have done, but simply by coming in faith to him. But there are going to be so many, uh, even some who have heard the good news, and some who are within the preaching of, the, of Bethel here. Uh, Bethel tries to do so many things to reach the community to uh, uh, try to, to get people who are within uh, our environment to hear the good news that God has provided salvation. We send out missionaries. We need to do everything possible to get the good news out that God has provided eternal life through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But still, there are those who haven't heard, and there are those who have heard but have not responded. And so John just uh, points out the, the, the tragic fact that heaven is there, access is free, but it's only by faith in Christ. And uh, uh, there's going to be an award ceremony too. Uh, no. I don't know if you've ever participated in one of those uh, to be on the receiving end of it. But in the good news is in heaven, all of you will be on the receiving end of an award ceremony. We're told, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. Now, this is not uh, in the sense of salvation. This is not deciding who's going to get into heaven and who isn't. So it isn't like you, uh, or you haven't done enough work. You can't get in. This is not about uh, access to heaven. This is about how has our life been invested? How have we used the abilities and gifts God has given and heaven is going to be filled with people who have incredible rewards, not because uh, they have had some spectacular leadership position or because they've given millions of dollars, but there are going to be people in heaven who've had a simple and humble, almost invisible life and ministry, but they've done for God what God had gifted and called them to do. They've been faithful. And they're going to hear God say in Christ say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over much. Uh, and whatever gift or ability God has given you uh, is to be used for God. And rest assured, uh, no gift, no ability that's given by God and used for God uh, goes unnoticed by God. Uh, he, he knows everything you and I do. And uh, I, I think of the people in my own life who uh, just, God used them in so many significant ways, and yet they were not uh, uh, known worldwide. Uh, I, I think of uh, Mose the barber. <laughs> now, uh, you might say, well, uh, uh, Mose in my small town had a barber shop, but his life was quite different before. Uh, he lived in a sod shack. He was an alcoholic. Uh, he had one home he burned down, and uh, he, he was everything you would not want to be. He came to faith in Christ, and his life was so transformed, Mose became a barber. You could never get in his chair and not hear the gospel. Uh, he got down on his knees every morning when he opened that shop and prayed. Every person who ever came to Mo uh, Moses' barbershop to get here, and it was the only barbershop in the whole community, so you had to go there. Uh, but you never went there without hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, when you get to heaven, Moses is going to be there. And uh, you're going to have multiple rewards because of all of the people he prayed for, all of the people he witnessed to. And I had the privilege of visiting Mose when he was bedridden. and his, uh, He lived to be a little over 100 years old. God kept him alive. 
And, you know, when I visited him, he had a sheet of paper. Now, he just did, you know, the eight and a half by 11 sheets. He would tape them together. And he had just roll after roll taped together like this. And the names of people, and, and uh, even in his sick bed, he was praying every day. He'd go and pray for all of the people on that list. And uh, people like that, you see, who have served God, who have used their gifts and opportunities, uh, they're going to be there and enjoying the presence of God. Uh, they're going to be uh, as, as uh, uh, blessed and benefit as Billy Graham or some other great evangelist or missionary. Uh, God is going to reward everyone for what they do. So whatever you do for Christ, whether it's simply to be on your knees to pray, if it's to teach, it's to give, if it, whatever it is, no work that's done for God goes unnoticed and will, will uh, escape God's blessing in eternity. So he said, uh, I will give to each person according to what they have done. And that is not, like we say, uh, you get into heaven or you don't get into heaven. This is the idea of believers who have been gifted by God for a whole variety of ministries. That every believer in Christ has some gift, some ability, something they can do for him. And uh, it's God is speaking, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Three ways of saying I, I'm, I'm the start and the finish. I, I'm all there is. Uh, God is the Alpha and Omega, the, the beginning and the ending uh, letters of the Greek alphabet. Uh, God is the first and the last. Before there wasn't anything, God was. In one sense, after there would be anything, God is. So he's eternal. And, uh, but he goes on to pray, heaven is, is for the redeemed, uh, for those who have come and through faith in Christ have experienced the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Now, uh, you and I, that's, the symbolism there is that they, we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, we're not clothed in our own uh, sinful righteousness, but clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So when God looks at you and me in heaven, he doesn't see us. He sees the benefits purchased through the death of Christ on the cross. Uh, you and I will be uh, uh, wearing uh, new robes, as it were, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And he says, that blessed are those who wash their robes. We don't wash them in tide. <laughs> we wash them. Uh, in, in the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. And we're going to be uh, there. They have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Uh, this new Jerusalem is not going to be all there is in the new heavens and the new earth. It's coming down from God and John sees it. He's already on the high mountain when he sees the new Jerusalem coming down. So there's going to be life and, and the area outside of the new Jerusalem but free access to it. So you and I are not going to just read about it, but we will have the privilege and the access of entering into it. Uh, and some of the things we, we can't really fully comprehend, but there's going to be an inside and an outside. In other words, uh, uh, in the eternal state, they may have the right to the tree of life, may go through the gates into the city, outside of the dogs. Now, uh, if you like dogs, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just an expression here. It's not to, picking out this animal from another animal. It's simply pointing outside are all of those uh, and who are sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, you name it. Uh, those who have uh, uh, just lived without God and whatever they've done, they've done it because they have not accepted God's provision of salvation. Uh, they're going to be on the outside. Now, some things are hard to explain. Uh, because if you and I are going to be able to go in and out of this uh, uh, city, uh, New Jerusalem, uh, these people are outside. Are we going to be out mingling with them? The answer is no. John is just, I think, here saying, listen, those people have no access or right to that which God has provided and prepared. You and I will have full access, but we have it only through Christ. And that's where John now comes to that, that invitation uh, to make clear, the invitation is open. Bev Shea is going to sing. <laughs> Come just as you are. And, uh, and heaven is available to all who believe. Uh, Jesus now is speaking. Because Jesus is the one 
who has been uh, leading this, this revelation to John and Jesus, I, Jesus, am the root and the offspring of David. So you see, here in, in heaven is the, the Christ who had a birth in Bethlehem that we celebrate this time of year. He was a descendant of David, but he was the son of God. The only person in all of human history who was both God and man. And in the, the eternal state, Jesus is still God and man. But his humanity is a perfect humanity. Uh, there, there's a sense in which in, in heaven, you and I will be able, I think, to recognize Jesus, but we'll not be going up and glad-handing him as if he was just one of us. We'll be worshiping him, standing in awe of all he has done for us. But John goes on to say, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let anyone who hears say, come. And you and I are those who hear. We are reading the book of Revelation, and we join with, uh, with Christ. We join with the church. We join with this broad, timeless group of people who, uh, who say, listen, God has provided salvation. It's in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Come, come. Uh, the water of life is there. It's available to all who will come in faith. And so you and I join them saying, come, uh, let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Uh, if you had wandered in from the desert and someone offered you a drink of water, uh, you would say, well, has this been purified? Uh, is, is, where, where, what well did this come from? You and I would be so grateful for that, that drink of water. And the water of life is what he's talking about here. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. And uh, while that's an invitation, John never wants to end without also a bit of a warning. He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, <laughs> don't add to them. Don't mess with the manuscript. And there are many uh, people uh, in, in recent years who wanted to question the book of Revelation. They said, well, I don't like this part. I like that part. And it's been particularly noteworthy that uh, so many like the first chapter and maybe even the first three chapters and like the last two chapters, but they don't believe what's in between. Uh, listen, you can't have the uh, opening chapters, the closing chapters, without accepting all this in between that God has revealed. And you and I have been looking at that over the past weeks. They said if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. Listen, uh, if you read about those things in chapters uh, 4 through uh, 20, uh, don't mess with them because if you do, you're likely to end up with all of those uh, plagues. If anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, if, if you and I uh, look at and we say, we, I don't fully understand this verse. Oh, your name is going to be taken away. No, it's not, not a case of understanding. It's one who rejects the message of the book of Revelation is not going to enjoy the fruit uh, and the water of life and the water, uh, the fruit from the tree of life. And, uh, and John is not able to end the book without another invitation. Uh, the book of Revelation, uh, in one sense, is not a, a, a book that is designed to exclude people. Quite the opposite. It's designed to invite people, to urge people to say, listen, this decision is the most important decision you can make. Uh, Billy Graham chose a good title, The Hour of Decision. Uh, and this is not just the hour of decision. This is, in one sense, maybe the moment of decision when you and I have that choice to make. And John closes out the book of Revelation with this message. He said, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. And that's Jesus speaking, as we saw in the previous verses. And John said, amen, come, Lord Jesus. John is an old man at this point, 
Uh, this is probably in the late 90s, and John was the last surviving uh, of the 12 apostles. Uh, John was on the Isle of Patmos. He's a prisoner under the notorious Roman emperors. He's going to die there, as it were, but he, he's not lamenting and saying, get me off this island. <laughs> he's saying, listen, uh, even so, come, Lord Jesus. I'm ready. I'm eager. I'm looking forward to, to the coming of Christ. And I hope that describes your attitude and mine today. Uh, it's not that we don't like this life. We're, we're very much a part of it. We rejoice in the things we enjoy day by day. And yet there's that part of us as a believer in Christ that's saying, heaven is my home. This is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And we find our hearts sometimes saying, come, Lord Jesus. Uh, may, may it be soon. And we, we're torn this sense of, uh, uh, you know, it may be soon, we're, we're eager for it to come, and yet we find we've got things we want to do here. And we live in this in-between, as it were, looking forward and anticipating the coming of Christ, and yet saying, what is there that I ought to be doing today for Christ and preparing for that day, but investing my time and energy and my resources in uh, enabling others to come to faith in Christ. And John closes out the, the book of Revelation with this simple declaration, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with God's people. Amen. And I hope all of us say amen. What God has done and provided for us. I thank you again so much for being a part of this class. Uh, this is our last class, and I do want to thank all of you again for the cards and gifts, for your prayers, the encouraging words. You are special. It's been a delight to teach, yes. I just want to, on behalf of the elder board, just really, the whole church, just thank you so much for what you've done in sharing the word with all of us. And I think when you walk through the location, you know, you say, Dr. Hannah, we've got a class for you. Well, but, but I think everyone will sign up for Paul's classes. <laughs> you know? And I'll be happy to say, listen, Paul, I was teaching your words, but I, I will take the back seat. Would you mind explaining this to me? Thank you, brother. Listen. I said it last week. I think Dr. Hannah was the best thing that was ever made in Canada. And that's part of the thing. I think Well, and... Uh, uh, someone, uh, someone described they just uh, they met someone driving from Saskatchewan and they couldn't get out of there fast enough. Uh, so, uh, but we're it, this has been a blessing, uh, and I have said it before, but I would say it again, just like the, uh, the man at the wedding in Cain of Galilee, you've saved the best till last. Uh, it doesn't get any better than this. So, thank you so much. It's been a joy. Pastor Craig, were you in the Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I missed last week when people were sick, but I just want to pray for Ken, Lord. <clears throat> we just praise you from whom all blessings flow. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Ken was just saying, that you use each of us in our gifts mm -hmm. and abilities mm -hmm. uh, for your glory and for our joy. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I know that Ken has enjoyed teaching and ministering to us. And Lord, we thank you for him. We continue to encourage him and use him. Thank you for the technology that you've given us to be able to go back and especially watch these last couple of years of classes uh, through the Bible. And I just pray that you bless Ken and Mary and uh, give them continued joy in you. And we thank you for them and pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you.